So welcome everyone to the tutorial on um, international human rights, which is tonight's topic, and we are now in week 10. And uh, so welcome, uh, Clinton, Emma, Fe, Heidi, Jack, Kathleen, Mercy, Pita, and Tamara, welcome to tonight's tutorial. International human rights is a topic that students, especially those taking up constitutional law, often cite, and they would say that, you know, a decision made by the Commonwealth Parliament is uh, in breach of uh, the international obligations of Australia. And oftentimes you hear people say, oh, but if Australia does this, then it's breaching its uh, obligations under international law, uh, especially concerning the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Or they probably say, oh, it's a violation of the uh, international... Good afternoon. Mute everyone now. Okay. Or sometimes we hear people say, oh, it's a violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Polit Political Rights, of which Australia is a party. Uh, oftentimes, it's not, it is not as simple as that, mainly because we need to know if, uh, for example, the, the key question we need to ask is whether or not the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, of which Australia uh, is in fact a signatory to, is a... Uh, you know, uh, involves any binding legal obligations on the part of Australia, or whether or not it is just a mere declaration. And uh, looking at, for example, at the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of which Australia uh, is a party, if we assume that Australia is in fact, uh, you know, has legal obligations under that particular convention, would it then mean that if Australia fails to abide by that, uh, by that convention, it is necessarily in breach of international law. And would it also mean that uh, individuals, perhaps citizens of Australia, or citizens of a state to which, uh, which is a party to the convention, can then file perhaps a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights on the ground that its state is in breach of its uh, obligations under the, under the convention. So these are some of the questions we ask. And the question about international human rights uh, becomes even more complex when you consider the fact that there are some states which actually uh, have constituent states. So for example, if you look at Australia or the United States of America, in Australia, for example, we have states like Victoria, Tasmania, uh, Queensland, and so on. Same thing in the United States. And what if, what if there are, you know, what if Australia or the, or the United States of America might be a party to the International Convention on, on um, Civil and Political Rights? What if a state is a party to, for example, the United Nations Convention Against Torture, and then one of its constituent states, so when I say constituent states, I'm talking of, you know, the states such as Queensland, Tasmania, and so on. Uh, and what if these states enact a law that is in violation of uh, a treaty entered into by, into by, you know, by the state itself. So, for example, um, there is a case of um, Tunan versus Australia, where in the 1990s, uh, Tunan is a was an openly gay, was an openly gay individual uh, in 1990, and uh, but there was a law in Tasmania that uh, prohibited that criminalized uh, sexual behavior between men. Uh, that was under the Tasmania uh, Criminal Code. And the problem, however, is that if you examine the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of which Australia is a party, uh, Article 26 of that particular convention provides uh, the right to equality of people before the law. So there was a claim on the part of Tunin that, uh, you know, Australia was in breach of its obligations under international law, under the convention, but as a result of a law of the state of Tasmania. But there was no Commonwealth law that, you know, criminalized uh, sexual behavior among men or sexual behavior between men. So... And that, that's an interesting case, uh, which we will try to examine in a short while. So uh, tonight, therefore, we talk about, uh, we're, we're looking at uh, international human rights. We're trying to provide the basics first. And the next week, we try to examine uh, international human rights 
uh, especially about from the viewpoint of how to enforce perhaps uh, international human rights uh, by citizens and uh, whether or not uh, it is possible for uh, international human rights to be violated by companies and if so uh, would there be remedies on the part of citizens so when you speak of international human rights does it mean that you know the, the rights can only be the, the the ones with the legal obligation to observe rights does that lie only with the state or could companies uh, be in violation of um, international human rights and if so can there be recourse under international law? We're, we're going to be examining that question next week, but in the meantime, we need to provide that groundwork to know to what extent uh, international human rights uh, conventions can actually be considered to be law within a state, and you know what remedies and rights of enforcement might exist on the part of individuals. So tonight, after uh, studying this topic, you should be able to discuss and explain international human rights and the international human rights regime and the enforcement of international human rights. Now, before I begin, would there be any questions from anyone or any comments? I've prepared five questions tonight, five discussion questions, including the, uh, the quiz question. I've purposely uh, put the uh, quiz question as the last of the agenda. So we're going to be covering uh, four other questions before we tackle the quiz question. No questions so far or comments? So we could proceed. Okay, we're very good, very good. So can I get someone to uh, read question one for us? Just to read the question. Can I get a hold of that man, Joe, if you like? Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you. The state of Oceania is a Commonwealth constituent state like Australia and the US. Oceania is a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which provides under Article 26 thereof as follows. The law shall prohibit any discrimination and guarantee to all persons equal and and effective protection against discrimination on any ground such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or so, social origin, property, birth or other status. Atara, one of Oceania's constituent states, recently passed a law that uh, criminalized various forms of sexual conduct between men and including all forms of sexual conduct between consenting adult homosexual men in private. Mr. Gilmore, an Otarian resident and openly gay man is alarmed by this development. He has come to you as a solicitor for legal advice. Advise Mr. Gilmore whether Oceania is, Oceania is in breach of its international obligation. So can I just get you all to say yes or no? So yes, Oceania is in breach of its international obligations. No, it's not. Have a think, and then, you know, when you're ready, try to provide an answer in the chat box. And if anyone is prepared to, as well to uh, explain his answer, please turn on your, your, your mic. Can I get people to provide an answer in the chat box? Yes or no? Yes, it is in breach. No, it is not. So just yes or no. Mm -hmm. For Mercy, the answer is yes. From Clinton, it's a no. From Peter, it's a no. Mm -hmm. So one, two, three, four, five. One, two, three. Okay. 
overwhelmingly, the answer from students is no. Only Mercy says yes. Would anyone care to provide an answer? Manjo, I said no. Because, I said no because I think that it um, is a similar situation to, well, it's a very like situation of uh, Tasmania, Australia. Mm. Um, it's only controllable by that with that state, and it's something which um, is it's not enacted. It's Oceania who has signed the convention, mm. not Tasmania or not the Atara. Mm. And I, I think that that's the reason why it's um, it's not um, not applicable. The same with um, many states of the United States, even though they um, they've got a, a, a national agreement mm. with many of these conventions, the individual states often go against them. Mm. Very good. From, um, okay, from tomorrow, I don't have much of a voice at the moment. That's all right. From Kathleen needs to be ratified by the Commonwealth mm, for it to be a law. Interesting. Very good. Yeah. The principle of incorporation. From Clinton, for the covenant to be legally binding, the states that ratified it would have to have agreed for it to be legally binding, and there is no information that indicates that Oceania has agreed to that. Uh, this is a, this, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights is a legally binding uh, convention. It is a treaty under international law. It binds states. So just, just to clarify. Now, the, but Kathleen has raised a valid point, though. Uh, based on the principle of incorporation, conventionally, or um, you would say generally, a treaty does not automatically, uh, is not automatic and tra tra automatically translated into a domestic law. It must be incorporated in a statute. For it to be binding uh, among citizens, okay, for it to be binding, you know, for it to apply to the citizens of a state. But would it mean that uh, if it hasn't been incorporated in a statute, or enacted by the Commonwealth Parliament, for example, does it mean that it doesn't have any, any, uh, it doesn't raise any legal obligation on the part of the party? So let me repeat that, because we're talking of the principle of incorporation. So generally, as we said, even if a, a state enters into a treaty, and so we know therefore it is legally binding under international law, under the principle of incorporation for any rights or obligations arising from the treaty uh, to be part of domestic law, the state itself, under the principle of incorporation, must incorporate the provisions of the treaty into a, into a law, meaning it must enact a statute or a law that incorporates the treaty or convention obligations or rights. So it doesn't become a law within the state itself in general, generally, and the principle of incorporation. But the other question is, if that is so, does it mean that a state would not be in breach of its international obligations if, you know, if there is in fact a violation of a treaty provision and the treaty itself has not been uh, incorporated in a statute? Are they one and the same? Can I get somebody to try to explain these, these concepts for me? Can somebody try to explain? Can you see, did, did, were you able to see the, see the distinction that I was raising? And we're actually going to be examining the principle of incorporation in a short while as well. Can I, can I get some comments? Any attempt? Um, Manjo, I, they're yeah. definitely different. Huh? <laughs> um, we, they're, different they're definitely different, yes. which is why I kind of struggled a bit with the actual mm. answer. Um, so 
I, what I really don't get is, I suppose that you can be um, in breach of international obligations, but there's not a lot that can be done. Obviously, you can go, um, you know, a complaint can be made, um, mm. but certainly that's going to only end up in an outcome that's like a stern letter or apparently a not so stern letter um, to the state. Um, in regards to the ratification and the legal and and, and making something um, legally binding for yeah. um, the common the entire Commonwealth and that includes the states, mm -hmm. um, you know, there you know the country doesn't actually adopt um, the treaty until it's um, you know until it's, it's part of a statute. Whereas a country can still, or a state can still be in breach of its international obligations, regardless of, of whether or not um, they have actually included that in a statute and therefore um, made it legally binding to their entire country. Very um, good. Yes, go on. Yeah, so that's what I suppose I don't really get by this question because um, it says Oceania is in breach of its international obligations. Yes. Um, obviously being a party to um, the treaty, they have actually um, not just become a signatory of it, but they've actually um, um, either that A word or ratified it. So, um, you know, that makes it um, an, part of their international obligation. Hmm. Okay, so uh, thank you, Kathleen. Kath Kathleen uh, raised uh, correct principles of international law. Number one, she said that uh, the mere fact that, you know, if a state is a party to a treaty, it means that that, that that state, therefore, has legally binding obligations under international law. So that state that is a party to a convention or a treaty is bound under international law to obey by the treaty provisions under the principle of Pacta Sultra Banda, and any breach of treaty obligations would mean that um, that that state would be in violation of international law. Uh, the aspect about remedies, for example, it's not just a question of a stern warning, but the fact remains that uh, there could be a state that can complain against another state in violation of a treaty obligation with the International Court of Justice. And it, is, it isn't as if, you know, a decision by the International Court of Justice against a state carries no meaning. It does. Because, you know, um, if the International Court of Justice renders an opinion and a state uh, renders opinion against a state and uh, makes a decision that a state is in violation of international law and that state refuses to act on, on that decision or fails to rectify or remedy its violation of international law, there will be repercussions from the international community and its reputation is likely to be diminished in the eyes of the international community because you are a violator of international law. Now, if you are the United States or Russia, perhaps you don't care, but if you're some other state, you value international opinion. You value international reputation because imagine a state that says, you know, um, I am in breach of a treaty and I know that my reputation is, is diminished or eroded, but I don't care. But it would also mean that he, it, that state cannot be trusted in international law. Why bother entering into a treaty with another state that doesn't care whether or not it will comply with its treaty obligation? So there is, in fact, a uh, there is in fact a political effect, if you might say. Okay, so there is a legal effect from the ICJ, but at the same time, there will be a political effect. If a state uh, is known to constantly violate its treaty obligations, there's no reason why other states would wish to enter into a treaty with that other state because it cannot be trusted. It's like entering into a contract with a person who you know is likely to violate the contract. So there is a repercussion. But the other aspect about the principle of incorporation is correctly pointed out by Kathleen is that although it becomes uh, a, a legal obligation on the part of the state, it does not become a source of obligations under a domestic law. So the citizens of a state who are, that is a party to a convention will not be able to uh, derive any rights in general, will not be able to derive any rights or obligations on the basis of a treaty that has not been incorporated in a statute or not, has not been adopted by a state in the form of uh, a, a law or a statute. So are we clear? That's just the general principle there. So going back to this, the, the basic legal issue is, given the fact that it is Oceania, so remember, under international law, 
it is a state, a sovereign state that is that can be the that can only sovereign states can be subjects of international law. So constituent states like Queensland, um, Victoria, or New South Wales cannot uh, be subjects of international law, and they cannot enter into uh, treaties. Treaties as defined under the um, uh, under the Geneva, Geneva Convention on on treaties, or rather on the Vienna Convention on treaties. So they cannot. Although they can certainly enter into international agreements. So in this particular context that we have, it is Oceania as a state which has the legal obligations. And it would appear that one of its constituent states is in breach of a treaty obligation. The question is, does that mean that the actions of a constituent state can be imputed to the sovereign state so that it is the sovereign state that would then be in violation of international law? And the other question that would have to be raised is whether or not that sovereign state would need to take remedial measures to redress any violation of international law. And then I'll answer uh, Tamara's question in a short while, because Tamara uh, raised a question, if Gilmore, an individual, puts in a complaint, doesn't it go back to the state of Atara to determine? So we're not yet looking at uh, you know, what Gilmore could do. The question is asking now whether Oceania is in breach of its international obligations, because Tasmania or not Tasmania, because Otara, a constituent state, has uh, passed a law that violates the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And the answer actually is the one that was given by, by Mercy. Yes, the answer is Oceania is in breach of its international obligations. So in the case of Tunin versus Australia, the United Nations Commission on Human Rights made a determination so if you look at the case of Tunin versus Tasmania, uh, Tunin uh, was openly gay and you know, he engaged in homosexual sex. And however, in Tasmania at the time, in the 1990s, there was uh, a, a law in this criminal code that criminalized uh, homosexual sex, which was in violation of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, which Australia was a party to. And so um, the, the United Nations Convention, uh, Co Commission on, on Human Rights, which is the uh, body responsible for making sure that uh, treaty obligations under the ICCPR are in fact complied with by states, made a determination, issued a report, it's not a decision, issued a report that Australia was in, Australia was in violation of its international obligations under the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, even though it was actually Tasmania, which had a law that uh, was in violation of the ICCPR. And so as a consequence, uh, at some point, uh, I'm not sure how it was resolved, but on this basis, um, I think it was Tasmania that eventually, you know, decriminalized uh, the uh, homosexual sex upon, upon um, upon pressure from the, from the national government. Because otherwise, it was within actually the power of the Commonwealth Parliament to pass a law that would have uh, said that homosexual sex uh, was legal. Okay, so the ruling, uh, with the report of the United Nations Commission on Human Rights stated that Australia was in violation of its international obligations. So the answer here would be that I would advise Mr. Gilmore that Oceania is in breach of its international obligations. Now, whether or not Mr. Gilmore has recourse uh, in international law uh, is a different matter. We're going to examine that in quiz five, right? Because that is the question of quiz five. So from Tamara, for example, she says, but if Gilmore individual puts in a complaint, doesn't it go back to the state of Atara to determine? So it raises the question, would Mr. Gilmore uh, have had a, a right to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Or relatedly, how is it that the, when Mr. Tunin, which is an actual case in 1995, how is it that when Mr. Tunin filed a complaint with the United Nations uh, Commission on Human Rights, how is it that the United Nations Commission on Human Rights took cognizance of the complaint of Mr. Tunin? Note that under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, only states, sovereign states, can file a complaint against another state for a violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Individuals or citizens of states or subjects of states 
do not have any right under the ICCPR to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So which makes us wonder, how is it then, if that is so, if the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights expressly provides that only states uh, can file a complaint against another state uh, for violating the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights with the Commission on Human Rights of the United Nations, how is it that the United Nations Commission on Human Rights took cognizance of a complaint by Mr. Tunan, who was a, you know, just a citizen of Australia? I won't answer that yet. We're going to get back to that in, in, um, in, in the question five, which is the quiz. And so uh, Mercy got that correctly. Very good. Thank you, Mercy. Question so far. Uh, and from Kathleen, not all domestic measures are exhausted. So oftentimes, yes, that's correct. So if you look at the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights before a state, so I'm talking about state, before a state can uh, file a complaint against another state with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights, it must have been shown that there has been an exhaustion of all domestic remedies. So meaning you, you could have tried the courts, you could have tried parliament, and so on. Question so far? We're good? Okay. Question two. Can I get somebody to read question two? Can I get somebody to read question two? Uh, yeah, I'll read it for you. Thank you, Jack. Alfred Gamble is in death row in the state of New Kenya. He ha is awaiting his execution by public hanging at the city's main plaza after having been convicted by a court. The state of New Kenya is a member of the United Nations and a signatory to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 5 of the UDHR provides no one shall be subject to torture or to cruel, inhumane or degrading treatment or punishment. Is the state of New Kenya in breach of international law? On the basis of the United Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Okay, so from Kathleen, no. From Tamara, no. What do the others think? Because I often hear from students saying, oh, you know, that's a violation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. I often hear that. Mm. So a lot of the students are saying, no, why, not? Why, why isn't the state of New Kenya in breach of international law? Okay, from Tamara, they're only a signatory. Okay, meaning what? From Heidi, no, because torture cannot be defined. From tomorrow, they acknowledge it. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. From Kathleen, because the death is not prolonged and they're only a signatory. Well, what does it mean when you say that they are not a signatory? I think we're missing something here. From PETA, not unless the treaties are uh, ratified, but aren't agreeing to be bound with. Ah, from Jack, is it because the United Na United Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not legally binding? That is the correct answer. The Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not a treaty. Is that, it is not a convention. It is not a source of international obligations. It is just a mere declaration. Okay, now, although it is a, a mere declaration, of course, as we know, it is possible for it at some point to become customary international law. But uh, it is difficult to argue that on the basis of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights itself, a treaty, uh, a state can be, a state who signs the Universal Declaration of Human Rights can be uh, uh, the subject of any uh, legal obligation on the on the basis of a declaration. So the proper answer is, uh, it is because the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is not uh, a, a treaty or a convention. It is merely a declaration. So we need to know, So, and you will oftentimes uh, notice that states do enter into declarations, especially in the General Assembly. And you would think, ah, because you know a state has um, signed a declaration about whatever, Declaration against this, declaration against that. You would you would think that it means that there is a 
a, a legal obligation on the part of the state of a state that uh, signs uh, that particular declaration? The answer is no, unless it is quite clear from that declaration that it was intended to be a treaty under the Vienna uh, Convention on Treaties, meaning it was intended to be uh, a source of legal obligation. But otherwise, in general, if it's just a declaration, it is just a declaration. It is not a source of legal obligations under international law. Questions? So we're good. Okay, question three. Can I get somebody to read question three for us? Volunteer? Sorry, man, there's no question. Oh, there, there it is now. Sorry. Yeah. Perhaps, Mercy, you could read the question for us. Sure. Thank um, you. On question three, under the laws of the state of Oceania, composed of several provinces, a citizen or resident must secure a permit from the national government before removing residents to another province. The state of Oceania is a party to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Right, which provides under Article 12. Everyone, un everyone lawfully within the territory of the state shall, within that territory, have the right to liberty of movement and freedom to choose his residence. Two, everyone shall be free to leave any country, including his own. Jane Leichert applied for a permit to change residence to another province, but it was denied by the national government. She has come to you for legal advice. She wants to file an action in court questioning the constitutionality of the law for being in breach of the ICCPR. Advise Jane. Thank you. Thank you, Marcia. So when I say question the constitutionality of the law, we're talk talking of a domestic forum. So in this particular case, Jane is thinking of filing an action before the courts of Oceania. So it's not, it's not filing, a court, uh, filing a case with an international court. It, Jane is thinking of filing a, a, an action uh, questioning the constitutionality of uh, the law uh, before a domestic court of Oceania. So how would you advise Jane? So in other words, the, so for you to answer it, maybe in the chat box, can you just say, you know, likely or not likely? So is it likely for the court to declare the law unconstitutional? Or is it likely for the court to declare the, court, uh, the law to be constitutional? And then we'll ask why. Okay. So from Kathleen, un unlikely unless it has been made a domestic law. What do the others think? So would the law be constitutional or not? What do the others think? Mm, from tomorrow, no, going off what was discussed in question one. Mm -hmm. Okay. So when I say no, no. So what is it? Wait, so somewhere no going, yes, maybe, what does it mean? So is that law constitutional or not? So no unconstitutional, uh, yes, it is constitutional. So th something like that. From PETA, it needs to be made domestic law for the treaty to be law. So from tomorrow, it is unconstitutional. Okay. <laughs> Okay, so can I get somebody to um, explain his or her answer by turning on the mic and explaining the answer? Pita, do you want to give it a go? I'll give it a go. Thank you. If the treaty hasn't been um, ratified by making it into domestic law, it is un it is it is. Um, it stands, it's very unlikely, unless there's a, um, a, a such a, a declaration in their constitution, it's unlikely that it would um, get anywhere with it. 
you know, be pushing it uphill, shall we say, mm. to get anywhere. Yeah, so Peter is actually correct, and so is Kathleen and all the others who say that the law would be constitutional. The reason for this is that uh, the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, even if uh, the state of Oceania is a party to it, would not uh, lead to, would not be a source of obligations on the part of the state towards its citizens, unless that particular covenant, uh, that particular convention has been ratified uh, and then incorporated uh, into, into uh, legislation by Oceania. Okay, so are we clear? Based on the principle of incorporation, a treaty becomes, only becomes a source of obligation uh, of a state towards its citizens or subjects if that treaty, the treaty, the provisions of the treaty are incorporated in a statute, in a domestic statute or law, or adopted by the state in the form of a statute or law. Otherwise, it is not a source of obligation in general. So what's the difference between question one and question three? I can't even remember what's question one. Um, hang on. Three. Ah, okay, so we have still question four. Uh, what was question one about? Ah, about, ah, okay, 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 yeah. So question one was about uh, a domestic law that, uh, so it was the, so in, in question one, thank you, Tamara. So in question one, we talked about a constituent state that uh, passed a law that violated, uh, that was in violation of a treaty entered into by the sovereign state. So in that case, you know, the example I gave, it was like Tasmania passing a law that was in violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, of which Australia is a party. Okay, so that's a question. These are two different things, because in question one, the question was whether or not Australia or the, the, the sovereign state was in violation of its international law obligations. That was the question. And the answer is yes. So the, the sovereign state was in violation of its obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights because of a law passed by one of its constituent states that was in violation of the treaty or the covenant. So that was the question. The legal issue was, was the state in violation of, of um, international law? Question three is different. Question three asks whether or not a citizen, knowing that the state is in violation of international law, has recourse uh, in its domestic courts. That's a different question. So in other words, if you ask the question then, the question is, if a state is in violation of its treaty obligations, does it mean that the citizen of a state in violation of its treaty obligations can apply for a court for the state to do something about the violation? And the answer is no, unless the treaty has been incorporated uh, in, uh, in, a, in, a, in the domestic laws of a state through a statute or you know, a law. Okay, clear? So the answer here is, um, I would advise Jane uh, not to apply, uh, not to file an action questioning the constitutionality of the law because the law, the treaty is not a source of legal obligations on the part of Shania towards its citizens because that the treaty provisions have not been incorporated in a domestic law or statute. We're clear? From Kathleen, wasn't an application to domestic court? Okay. Yeah, I think she was referring to question one. Very good. So from Tamara, but she may have a recourse if she went internationally. Now the question is, would, assuming that she has no recourse, so we now know that because the, the treaty provisions under the ICTPR have not been uh, incorporated or adopted by the state of Oceania in its domestic laws, and we know that uh, the state of Oceania is in breach of its international obligations. The question then, correctly raised by Tamara, is can Jane file, uh, you know, file an action, file a complaint, for example, with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights on the basis of the fact that the state of Oceania 
is in violation of the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights, of which it is a party. What do you think? Yes or no? Can Jane, on the basis of the facts we have in question three, file a complaint uh, with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights? Yes or no? From Kathleen, yes, because she is an individual. Mm -hmm. What do the others think? So we're now looking at remedies. So we're looking at remedies in international law. We're looking at remedies, you know, in domestic courts. So from Kathleen, yes, she can complain with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Same thing with what Kathleen is saying. What do the others think? Because Jane is an individual, Jane can then file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Is that correct or not? It is not correct. The answer is it is not correct. Jane uh, has no recourse to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights because uh, under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, only states can file another complaint, a complaint against another state for violation of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Individuals do not have any right to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights because only states can file a complaint against another state for a violation of the ICCPR. But I, I raised earlier the point, so how was it that Mr. Tunin was able to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in, 19, in the 1990s, and it was taken cognizance of uh, by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights in 1994 on the, on the basis of the fact that Australia uh, was alleged to have violated its obligations under the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So why was Mr. K Tunin's case then taken complaint then or taken cognizance of the United, by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights but the example we gave here, we have an individual such as Jane, and we are saying, or I am saying, that the United Nations Commission on Human Rights will not or cannot take cognizance of her complaint. Ah, we're gonna go back to the answer in quiz five. Okay, leave it at that. Uh, so, so Kathleen is saying, so why does the text on page 701 say it must be individual, not group actions? We will go back to that point, uh, Kathleen, in a short while, uh, because we're missing something there, okay? Is that all right? Or you want me to answer, provide the reason now? Because this is part of the quiz question, remember? remember? So I think it's nice sometimes, you know, it's like a thriller, <laughs> if it can be called that. We're just gonna delay answering it because it's actually covered in the quiz question. Okay, so we're gonna get back to that, I assure you. So we have enough time anyway. So let's go to question four. So what we've done is we've covered key principles from quizzes, questions one to four, and then in quiz question five, we're essentially applying a lot of these principles in answering uh, question five, which is our quiz. Okay, can I get somebody to read question four, please? Can I get somebody to read question four? Yeah, I'll give it a go, Major. Thank you, Clinton. Mr. Charlie Wong has been on a working visa in the state of Oceania for the last three years. During that time, his wife Claudia, who was on a holiday to Oceania, gave birth to their daughter Noreen. Under Oceania's laws, Noreen is a citizen by birth. Prior to overstaying her visa, Claudia returned to her home country and left their daughter with Mr. Wong. When Mr. Wong lost his job, his work visa was cancelled. The Oceania Department of Immigration issued an order for Mr. Wong to leave Oceania within 30 days or face arrest and deportation. Mr. Wong is in a quandary. He wants his daughter, Noreen, to continue to live in Oceania, a developed nation. The state of Oceania is party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Under that convention, the best interests of the child should be given primary consideration in all government executive decisions. The convention, however, has not been incorporated into a law or statute in Oceania, which adheres to the incorporation principle. Mr. Wong has come to you for legal advice. What advice would you give him? Thank you. Thank you, Clinton. 
what advice would you give him? From Kathleen, I remember the case and he can't do anything. Mm -hmm. From Kathleen, just can't remember the name of the case. So in other words, the basic question we ask is, does it mean that if a state that is a party to a treaty has not incorporated the provisions of a treaty in a domestic law, that treaty therefore cannot in all instances, be the source of any legal obligation on the part of the state towards its subjects? Or could it be the source of some legal obligation? That is the question. So let's repeat that. So as we said, in general, if a state under the principle of incorporation has not uh, incorporated a, the, a treaty provision in, as part of its domestic laws, meaning a law has been passed by the legislature or parliament, then in general, it is not a source of legal obligation under the principle of incorporation. But the question is, does it mean then that you know, a treaty obligation can never be the source of any legal rights or a source of obligations on the part of the state towards its citizens, simply because the treaty has not been incorporated in the form of a statute? Aha, uh -huh, from Kathleen, the court may be guided by a treaty and international law. But what does that mean, Kathleen? What do you mean? By I think we did this in, um, I'm pretty sure we did this in administrative law, but I'm just trying to get all the memory back. Yeah. Um, I'm pretty sure that it's not actually legally binding, but um, the court um, should consider um, treaty and international law obligations um, once it gets to the stage of um, looking at all the laws and everything in place. Um, okay. It's like the final kind of guiding principle that it must consider in its deliberations um, because it's like looking at what um, the international expectation is um, mm. on human rights. Mm. So that is the correct answer there from Kathleen. It is not a source of rights per se, but it does lead to legitimate expectations on the part of citizens. So let me repeat. Per se, treaty, you know, a treaty that has not been incorporated in a domestic law is not a source of a legal obligation or rights on the part of citizens. But uh, a treaty, treaty provisions can be a source of legitimate expectations. It becomes a source of legitimate expectations because citizens would expect legitimately that the state would abide by its international obligations. So following the case of Minister of uh, uh, Immigration and Ethnic Affairs versus Teo, uh, the, the High Court ruled in, in, that, in, that, in that sense that uh, when a state enters into a, uh, becomes a party to a treaty, even if that treaty has not been incorporated into a domestic law, it can lead to legitimate expectations on the part of its citizens. Same thing with the case of Becca Wilson. Uh, versus minister for uh, in the environment. So it can lead to legitimate expectations. It is not per se a source of rights, not a source of obligations per se, but there would have to be an understanding that when the executive, the government executive, so meaning from the viewpoint of executive as opposed to the legislature or the courts, okay? It is expected that the executive, when it uh, looks into, uh, a determination of uh, certain individuals that appear before it, such as the Department of Immigration, the Department of Immigration in that particular case would be expected to consider the treaty obligations of, of, um, of Oceania and therefore act accordingly. So as correctly pointed out by Kathleen, the court may be guided by a treaty and international law and the, and the executive definitely would have been uh, guided by... Um, by, by the treaty obligations of, uh, of Oceania, even if it is not really uh, a source of legal obligations under international law. So it does have an effect. So the correct answer here would be that if 
Mr. Wong, we in fact to uh, apply for a review of the decision of the executive uh, asking him to be deported. If he goes, for example, if he files, for example, an application for judicial review, the courts are likely uh, to grant his application uh, to, for him not to be arrested and deported, so meaning that decision of the Department of Immigration is likely to be quashed on the ground that Mr. Wong had a legitimate expectation that the executive, uh, which is the, you know, the representative of the state, would have acted in accordance with its treaty obligation. There would have been a legitimate expectation to that effect. Okay. So in Kiowa, they got back, sent back anyway. Yeah. Uh, so Kiowa would, 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 so when we talk about the, the principle of legitimate expectations, the courts have, have observed that uh, this usually is in the case of you know, the principle of natural justice, but uh, I don't want to get into that because it can get confusing for those who haven't taken up constitutional law or administrative law because it, it's get, it gets into that. So the point I'm just trying to raise here is that we make a distinction between a source of legal obligations, which is usually immediately enforceable, as, a for, as opposed to legitimate expectations, which means that the executive would uh, conventionally be expected to act in accordance with its tre treaty obligations, and courts are likely uh, to, to act in a way that would compel the, the executive to act in accordance with its treaty obligations. Any questions so far? We're clear? Very good, Kathleen. Kathleen knows a lot. Wow. Very good, Kathleen. Very good. Okay. So this is another quiz question. Can I get somebody to read the quiz question for us? Question five. Volunteer? Heidi? Can you read it for us? Or Kayla? Can I get a volunteer? This is a very long question. I'm hoping that you know we have somebody else reading the question for us. Oh, it's still not up yet. Okay, so there's a, a lag there. Michael, perhaps you could read the question for us if it's showing up now in your screen. Thank you. Uh, yeah, no worries. Okay. Okay, thank you. In 2018, the state of Finland passed a law which provides, among others, that only individuals who belong to the Mania ethnic group, recognised as the majority ethnic group in Finland, could be nominated and elected as members of the parliament of the state of Finland. Joshua Fremont, the leader of Otaro Political Party, a political party representing the Otaro minority ethnic group, is considering taking legal action against what he perceived to be a blatantly discriminatory law. Uh, as a lawyer, Fremont is aware that the 1948 Universal Declaration of Human Rights provides. Article two, um, everyone is entitled to all the rights and freedoms set forth in this declaration without distinction of any kind, such as race, color, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or other status. Furthermore, no distinction should be made on the basis of the political, jurisdictional or international status of the country or territory to which a person belongs, whether it be independent, trust, non-self-governing or under any other limitation or sovereignty. Uh, you'll, have to move, you'll have to move it down. Thank you. Can you see it now? So there's some delay. Has it shown up yet? Uh, still not shown up yet, no. Oh, that's a delay. What did it change twice, actually? Let's just wait, wait a bit. How come it's taking too long? Oh, oh yeah, I've got it now. Okay. Um, Article 7 of the UDHR provides, all are equal before the law and are entitled without any discrimination to equal protection of the law. All are entitled to equal protection against any discrimination violation of this declaration against any incitement to such discrimination. 
Article 2 of the 1966 International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, um, of which the state of Finland is a party also provides. Each state party to the present covenant undertakes respect and to ensure the, that all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction, the rights recognised in the present covenant without any distinction of any kind, such as race, colour, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national, social origin, property, birth or other, or other status. Very good. We're now down to the choices of answer. All right, uh, question five. So which of the following statements is the most correct? A, Fremont can file a complaint against the state of Finland to the United Nations Human Rights Committee, or HRC, established under the ICCPR for breaching its obligations under the ICCPR. Um, or B, Fremont can file a complaint with the United Nations General Assembly against the state of Finland for breaching its obligations under the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights, or C, Fremont can file a complaint with the International Court of Justice against the state of Finland for breaching its obligations under the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights and ICCPR. D, the state of Finland has violated customary international law that requires states not to allow any discrimination of any individual within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction on the basis of race, colour, sex, language, religion, political, or other opinion, national, social origins, property, birth, or other status. E, all of the answers are wrong. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I get everyone to attempt an answer? And uh, please provide your answer in the chat box. So we've got an answer now, B from Tamara. What do the others think? Again, a reminder to those who are viewing this, who will be viewing this recording later on, the letters that correspond to answers here uh, are gonna be different when it comes to the quiz because the, the answers in the quiz are actually shuffled. So from Tamara, B, from Emma, A, from Michael, E, from Jack, E. Okay, go on. From Dakota, E. All of the answers are wrong, okay? So we've got four, in, four, five students now saying E. Is that correct? Some are saying A. So it's A or E. Okay. So the popular answers are A and E. Would somebody care to explain his or her answer? And then by answering A, we then discuss the point raised by Kathleen. She referred to page 701 of a text. I'll go, Manjo. Um, yes? So I ruled out um, B and um, because um, the declaration issue, so um, it not being binding. That's right. Um, I ruled out the customary law, international law issue because um, that hasn't yet come into customary international law. Um, and C, um, I ruled out because um, I don't believe it's a matter for the International Court of Justice. Mm -hmm. um, but even if it were, only states can be subjects of uh, oh, yeah. yeah, with the ICJ. Okay, very good. But then I was torn between A and E, but I went for A because um, of the case of um, that Communist Party of Turkey, the Turkey, um, and also the Rafe, the Welfare Party um, versus Turkey. Um, the, the reason was because um, if they can apply to the European, um, whatever, that European Court of Human well, Rights, yes. then I'm pretty sure, like, I, obviously we don't know whether this is um, 
Yeah, so I would think that they would be able to apply to the United Nations Human Rights Committee um, to, um, yeah, discuss the same issues there that were in that Turkey case. That's why. Very good. Uh, what, what do the others think? How about those who said E? Uh, we have several students who think the answer is E. All of the answers are wrong. Yeah, Mandrew. Um, so I, I ruled out the um, D, C, B um, uh, for the same reason as Kathleen did. Yes. Um, and I ruled out A is because um, that only states can um, That's right. apply. That's the correct answer. So under the uh, International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, only states can file a complaint against another state uh, with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. And um, so how is it then, uh, going to the point about Tunin versus Australia, how is it that Tunin, Tunin's complaint to the United Nations Commission on Human Rights was taken cognizant of by the United Nations Commission on Human Rights? And the answer is because by then, uh, the United, but Australia had already become a party to the first optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. So there was another treaty that was subsequently entered into by states including Australia. And under the first uh, optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, individuals have a right to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So in other words, if a state is a party only to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, it doesn't give any legal standing to citizens to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. It is only when a state is both a party to the ICCPR and a party to the first optional protocol to the International Covenant of Civil and Political Rights that individuals would have a right to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. And under the facts, we didn't say that uh, the state of Oceania was a party to the first optional protocol to the ICCPR. So that's the answer there. Now, the, the, the example given by, by Kathleen about the European uh, Court of Human Rights, for example, that would be different because uh, a lot of the uh, states which are members of the European Union would have signed the, a treaty creating the European Union. And uh, it is on the basis of that particular treaty that uh, the citizens of these state parties have the right to actually uh, file a uh, a complaint with with the European with the European Court, so that's a different treaty altogether. This we're talking here of the ICCPR. So under the uh, under the ICCPR, uh, only states have the right to file a complaint, and uh, so that individuals can file a complaint only when a state is a party to the ICCPR, as well as the first optional protocol to the International Co Covenant of Civil and Political Rights. So the answer is the correct answer is all of the answers are wrong. Okay, questions, comments before we end tonight's tutorial? Yeah, I'm still confused over what the text says then. Why? Um, because on, on page 700, yes. um, oh sorry, on page 701, yeah. it just talks about actions brought to enforce the covenant can only be individual, not group uh, actions. There's no actio popularis. And um, it talks about... Um, generally covers individual rights as opposed to group rights. So is that talking, so what I'm taking from that is that it can't be brought by an individual, but it has to be brought by another state in regard to an individual's rights? No, the question is, are, are we talking of the same thing? Are we talking of the same thing? Yeah, so the heading 19.3.3, the International Covenant on Civil Wait. and Political Rights. Hang on, hang on. Are, you, are, you, uh, are you referring to the text provision of the treaty or are you talking about the textbook? I'm talking about the textbook. Okay, uh, I seem to have the old textbook here because there is no page 701. Uh, hang on. I may have it somewhere actually. Give me a second. Where did I put it? Okay. Okay, give me a second. Let's have a look at that. Okay, uh, which part were you referring to? 
Okay, there's two parts. One is under the key points, which is on page 701, and it says there's no Actio Popularis under the ICCPR, thus actions brought to enforce the covenant can only be, can be only individual, not group actions. Okay. Um, and then on page 699, yeah. it says, it generally covers individual rights as opposed to group rights. In other words, a person cannot bring a claim of violation of a group right. Mm. So what I'm asking is, does that key point about there's no action, um, it must be individual action. Yeah. Um, because it says thus actions brought to enforce a covenant can only be individual. Oh, okay, so okay. I was okay. thinking okay. that was individuals bringing it, oh, but my okay. thoughts now are the state must bring it on behalf of an individual. No, no, I, I think I think I, I see the, the the source of the confusion there. Uh, let's be clear, okay? Let's be clear. Uh, let's be clear. So under the International Covenant of Civil and Polit Political Rights, individuals cannot file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. That should be clear. And uh, it is only when a state is also a party to the first optional protocol to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights that individuals may be able to file a complaint with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. So let's be clear about that. That's clear. Now, in relation, therefore, to the, uh, to the principle of actio popularis, what this actually essentially means is that uh, if there were to be a right under the ICCPR that is violated, the right that can be violated is only an individual right. It cannot be in behalf of a particular group. We're not talking of enforce, enforcement here. When, when, uh, when Abbas talks about the key point there, he is not actually talk, he shouldn't be talking about enforcement with the UN, uh, United Nations Commission on Human Rights. Because unless a state uh, is a party to the first optional protocol to the ICCPR, uh, individuals cannot file a complaint with the, with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. What he is saying, however, is that uh, as far as rights under the ICCPR are, are concerned, these are individual rights and not, uh, not group rights, not rights actio popularis. That's essentially the principle that he's saying. So in other words, you, know, you cannot have a group uh, filing a complaint in behalf of an individual. It must be the individual himself or herself who has to, uh, who has to file the complaint, if at all. But that's distinct from the question of whether or not a citizen, uh, assuming that there has been a violation of the ICCPR, or an individual, assuming that a there has been a violation of the ICCPR, can of, of, on his own file a complaint uh, with the United Nations Commission on Human Rights. The answer is no, unless a state is also a party to the first optional protocol to the ICCPR. So those are two concepts. Although you know the word individual was being used twice, they're actually used in different senses. Was that clear enough? Hopefully, that, did that make sense? Yeah, I think so. It's just completely changed my whole reading of it. Um, so I have to reread it now. Right, okay, very good. Any other questions before we end tonight's tutorial? Uh, yeah, Mandra, just um, yeah. I'm, having, I'm having trouble with the evaluation. It's saying that the act activity is still hidden. Sorry, sorry. Can you repeat that for me, please? Uh, sorry, it's just um, the Moodle functionality with the, uh, if the course evaluation. It's um, giving me the message that it's currently hidden. Oh, that's weird because I can't even hide it. I'll have a look because I've actually seen students uh, providing some, you know, answering the survey already. So I wonder what's wrong there. Uh, as of this morning, uh, I think I had about, we had six students uh, doing the survey. And I'm not really in a position to hide the survey. It will come out whether you like it or not. So I wonder if um, there might be, oh, from Emma, mine says the same. You can't access it. Oh, very good. Okay, thank you for the feedback, Emma and um, Jack. I will send a message to Isaac to investigate because perhaps you know something is wrong there, but I actually have no control with making the, the survey visible or not. It's actually something that the university re really does. Oh, hang on. There was a, I, I received a message just this afternoon that their Moodle, I think, crashed or something. So that could have been it. It just happened today, this afternoon. I got that message. There was a, how do they call it? A downtime or something. So that might be the reason. In, in any event, I'll send them an email tomorrow morning just to check. Okay. So any other questions or comments? So we're good.
Okay, so thank you very much for, you know, really being, uh, you know, very engaging tonight. Uh, and it's always very enjoyable when, you know, students really ask questions. Very good. And, you know, try to answer. Thank you. And so uh, with that, we end tonight's tutorial. And we're looking forward to the week 11 tutorial. We got them just about two weeks ago before we end, uh, you know, the, the term. So thank you very much. And uh, see you again next week. Bye.